Our featured guest tonight is a member of one of the more popular hair metal bands of all time. Uh, their particular style found success with audiences nationwide and worldwide, uh, and their music videos were staples of MTV for what seemed like a decade. Um, he's here to chat about the band, uh, the journey, the music, uh, their mark on the music industry. Please give a warm weekly show welcome to Twisted Sisters, J.J. French. J.J., welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Dave. Appreciate it. So you were one of the founding members of Twisted Sister, but some of our audience might not know the origin story behind the band or yourself for that matter. Where did your personal music journey begin? Well, first, let me just correct one thing. When you use the term hair metal, which some people do. Um, we never regarded ourselves in that uh, world. We weren't part of that world. That world was a L.A. creation, a Los Angeles creation, of which Poison, Motley, Dokken. I mean, and they, they, they wouldn't be happy with that description either, but they they existed in the 80s. And Twisted Sister was a 70s bar band that made it in the 80s. That's how we that's how we looked at ourselves. You know, we we came out of a scene that most people will have no they can't imagine. Um, what the world would have been like. Forget COVID. The drinking age was 18 in those days, and which meant 15-year-old kids of fake proof uh, got in, and that fake proof was easily made in what is called shop class, which probably does not exist anymore in any school, so nobody would know what shop class is. But it was basically a DIY class, and you learn how to do certain things and with metal, and, you know, I mean, it was like shop. So there was printing presses, and you could make fake everything. I mean, it was just a joke. It was kind of a joke. And so given the fact that we're a tri-state area band and we came in the tri-state area has the largest pool of people population wise and the drinking age was 18, which means 15 year olds were getting in. You're looking at a pool of three to four million potential customers within a 50 mile radius of Manhattan. So that's important to understand that because the bar scene back when Twisted Sister started, which was uh, in late 72, to put it in perspective, Richard Nixon was president at the time. To give you an idea how long it was, Watergate had not happened yet. Um, McDonald's had only a million hamburgers sold. This is true. Um, gas was 23 cents a gallon. And the house rental for the band to live in was $300 a month, not a day. And, uh, you know, and you could and you work in bars and you played cover material, which means songs by other people. And you worked um, guaranteed six nights a week in most of these bars, and you made about $150 a night to start. So if you worked six nights, you made $900. But at $900, if your house rental is $300 and gas is $0.23 cents a gallon, you know, you made a profit with a five-man band. And so hotel rooms were $19.95 a night at the Red Roof Inn. And you generally played one club. You didn't move around from club to club. So you, you showed up on a Tuesday, stayed until Sunday night. However, you did play five shows a night, starting at 9 o'clock in the evening. You went on 9, 10, 11, 12, 1, and 2, and you ended at 2.40 in the morning. 40 on, 20 off, that's how you did it. And on weekends, usually there were show bands that these venues would hire, like the Coasters, Little Anthony and the Imperial, stuff like that, which meant that you would go on for your last two shows at 4 a.m., and finish at 4.40. And that was typical. Now, I've heard D, D doesn't really like, the, I guess, the term glam. I think he referred to it kind of as hid, hid metal. Is that the term? He well, used? it's because, you know, because the way he looks. And he makes fun of the way he looks. I make fun of the way he looks. I mean, I announce him on stage as saying he looks like Sarah Jessica Parker dipped in a vat of acid. I mean, that's how I introduce him because the P British press said that about him. And I thought that was one of the funniest lines I've ever heard. And he makes fun of himself. I mean, he's got a great sense of humor. Um, yeah, we were not glam -y, Okay. I mean, me and Eddie look cute, you know, uh, good. But, but you know, otherwise it was a heavy – we had a different vibe. It was not poison. It was not motley. And it wasn't Cinderella, even though Cinderella was from the East Coast. We were just a hard-nosed bar band from Long Island uh, who played heavy, super heavy rock and roll, but always had that uh, theatrical view. And so when D finally came in um, in 76, uh, he brought in with him his, his thing. So we always had a singer who kind of defined who we were. So the first lead singer was a Bowie fanatic. We did a lot of Bowie, right? So that was the, that was like the first glam period. Then we had another lead singer for a while who was a Rod Stewart fanatic, and so we kind of looked like the faces 
for a while, very short period of time. He was only in the band for about two months, but that was it. Then I took over singing lead for a while because I got sick of lead singers. And I can't sing, so we, of course, do Lou Reed and Bob Dylan because, you know, that's why God created them. So guys like me, you know, you know how you you know how you know that you do a Lou Reed song badly. You sing it on key. That's when you know you really screwed up a Lou Reed song. And um, and then that lasted a couple of months. And then my agent said, you know, you're not going to make any money with this Lou Reed crap. You need a Zepp, you need to sound like Zeppelin. And D was in a D could do it. So he had a reputation. And we I hired him. Uh, but D was also an Alice Cooper fanatic and a Slade fan and, you know, that kind of a thing. And, and, and Alice wasn't glam. He was kind of, you know, theatrically gross rock. Right. So D brought that version. And then and then shortly after D came in, Rocky Horror Show exploded. And so we started playing songs on the Rocky Horror Show and kind of we went through a phase where we looked like that transvestite stuff that Rocky Horror did. And that was the evolution basically of the band. band always had a look it was always theatrical always wore makeup until of course the last 10 years when we took it off and uh and we were inspired by really hard heavy bands and not uh glam and wimpy kind of like you know the la thing was always eh, you know it was never really to me it had no balls plenty of people love it that's great i never thought it was great and i would rather have taken my cues from slade Humble Pie, Black Sabbath, Judas Priest, ACDC, they were heavier bands. And that was kind of the evolution musically. How hard was it to finally get your first record deal? I mean, I heard it's a, it's a pretty crazy story there. Well, I mean, there's a documentary that, that tells the story. It was very hard. Nobody wanted to sign the band. So here we were, super popular, selling out all these clubs, which, again, if you're a musician in a club today putting COVID aside and you were able to draw a thousand people a night minimum five nights a week and on weekends able to draw five or five thousand people to a bar you understand what I'm saying a bar that holds five thousand people I'm not talking about a club that holds 200 people I'm talking about bars that held up to five thousand you would think to yourself well if I'm selling out five thousand seat bars then I have to be famous and I have to have a record deal the answer was no all the record labels in New York said, well, you got to suck. Why? Well, you've been around for years and nobody signed you. So therefore, you must suck. I mean, that was really the whole thing. That was like a mentality they all had. You suck. So in the documentary, um, I mean, I can use profanity. Yes? No? Yeah, I mean, we, I, can I, always, I, yeah. we can always do something. I mean, okay. So in the documentary, We Are Twisted <laughs> Sister, the whole long tale of the record deal is put out, you know, and it just was constantly almost constantly almost constantly almost constantly almost at the last minute things fell apart over and over and over and you know this story's not unusual the beatles were turned down by 29 record labels and and joan jett by 31 i mean you know you're gonna have these stories from just about every band but the way we were turned down was so magnificently torturous that the fact that we actually stayed together and continued onward is almost is really the miracle because um at one point or another you say to yourself how much can you take? You know, how much abuse can you take? How much rejection can you take? I do um, keynote speeches now. My book is coming out, and it's and it's called Twisted Business. And it basically, I teach the twisted method of business survival, and it's built into the story of the band because the tenacity that the band had to stay together and go through all this crap is the reason why you're talking to me. If we didn't have that, you wouldn't know me. You wouldn't care. Twisted wouldn't exist, and that would be the end of it. Well, I might. My family's from Long Island. <laughs> so, so where um, West Islip, Patchog, um, huh? uh, that basically mostly Suffolk County, ba Bayshore, Babylon. So yeah, Babylon. well, I mean, yeah, we played the Stony Brook Mad Hatter for years. Uh, the Comac Arena, you know, which we played with, we played with Leslie West at the Comac Arena. I mean, that one, 76, and Tommy James. I mean, from Hammerheads was in West Iceland. Yes, Hammerheads, I, what Hammerheads, I know exactly where that was. That was literally, yeah, that was, that was literally up the street from my grandmother's house. Yeah, so, so kids, understand what Hammerheads was. Hammerheads was a former A&P supermarket that was transformed to a club that held 3,000 people with a gigantic parking lot because, you know, parking lots in Long Island were gigantic. Yeah, now, I think, I, now, I, th now I think there's like a car dealership there or something. I mean, it's, it's, it's yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a big lot. It's right off of what, Sunrise, yeah. I think? 
Yeah, right off Sunrise Highway. So yeah. I mean, uh, if you look in Long, if you look at Long Island, the the size of the rooms in Long Island, the biggest one by sheer numbers was Hammerheads, followed sh- probably by the OBI East out in um, out in the Hamptons, which was a former hotel catering hall, which then transformed itself into a concert venue, which was a bar. No, I believe it or not, I spent a New Year's at the OBI once. So you know. I know the, the OBI. OBI yeah, you got to go over the bridge. The east. Um, what was it like finding your, your first real success in the UK? I mean, that had to feel kind of weird because you guys have been grinding in this club circuit in the US all those years, right? And then you blew up, you kind of blew up in the UK first, no? Well, we were huge here, but nobody else cared. So we had an independent single <laughs> that we released and it wound up in, I wound up on a playlist at a, uh, for a magazine called Sounds, which was a big rock paper. And some fan came into a bar one night at the Beggar's Opera in Queens and said, man, you're on a, you're like number one on a playlist. And I, I'm looking at him going, what, Whoa, number one, what, who, what? Yeah, man, this playlist in this magazine, they pulled out a copy of Sounds magazine. And there was a journalist, like all the, the writers would have their favorite singles. It was like a really underground, uber hip thing. And there was Malcolm Dome or Gary Bushel or Jeff Barton, one, uh, one of the journalists, and he had like a list, you know, top 10 singles, Tigers of Pantang, Motorhead, um, Iron Maiden, Budgie, all these, you know, British bands. And then at number one that week was Under the Blade from our single. We're like, oh, my God. Oh, my God. The world has heard. But then uh, you, at some point you were sought out by Atlantic for a record yeah, deal but, when, but, when they yeah, had passed but, you up before, right? Yeah, but see, Atlantic already passed on us in the U.S. a number of times, and they hated us. It didn't just pass on us. The president went out of his way to say we suck to his entire record staff. He said the next guy that even mentions the name will be fired. So we go to England, and we do a television show. And again, anyone can watch it online on YouTube. Put in Twisted Sister Marquee. No, Twisted Sister The Tube, T-U-B-E. And it was a two. It was a performance we did on live television, and I won't get into the specifics. And it's another long story. But the bottom line is, <clears throat> we did so well on that show that we were offered multiple record deals the next day in England by every major label. But the label that wanted us most was Atlantic. He apologized to me for his attitude. He said he was wrong, and he opened up the purse strings, brought Tom Worman in. We recorded. Stay hungry. And again, if that didn't happen, you and I wouldn't be sitting here because uh, those videos, you know, became, were famous. I want to talk about those videos, but first we've got to go to a quick commercial break. Uh, so we're going to go to a quick commercial break and then we're going to be back with JJ French of Twisted Sister. <laughs> 